Gunslinger Rest, how blessed of God we are to share once again in Bible study tonight. As we continue in our series, God's Word is Enough. We've been digging in Psalms 119 for the past few weeks, and we'll continue to do so tonight. Tonight, I want us to look at Psalm 119, verses 41 through 48. Psalm 119, verses 41 through 48. Let's pray, and then we'll dive into our lesson. God, our Father, we thank you again for this privilege to study your word. We thank you that your word is sufficient for everything we need. We thank you that your word never fails. Grass withers, flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths, that it guides us in the way that we should go and instructs us on how to live according to your way. Tonight, we pray that you would show us those things you'd have us to see. Speak those things you'd have us to hear. Teach us what you'd have us to learn so we can be who you've called us to be. More importantly, do what you've called us to do. Even now, Lord, sit Michael down. Let them see and hear Jesus, not me. Pray God your word go forth with clarity that your people be edified, and more importantly, you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 119, verses 41 through 48. From the English Standard Version, it reads, Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually, forever and ever. And I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and shall not be put to shame. For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. If you'll notice, the psalmist uses this theme of love in these verses. You see it mentioned three times throughout this particular part of the passage. It reminds us of our love and our commitment to obeying God's word. A preaching mentor of mine talked to me about an arranged marriage this one man had that his family and his wife's family before they were born arranged for them to be married based off their economic status. The man never saw his wife before his wedding day. The marriage was arranged decades before he met her at the altar, but he was still just as excited to meet her and marry her because he was taught that love is not just emotion, love is a commitment. And because he was committed to love her, he still found excitement and joy in marrying her. And they're still married to this day because he vowed to be committed to the vows he made in marrying his wife. The same should be for us in the word of God, that our love for God's word is not just expressed in how excited we get about it. It's not just expressed in how excited we are to read it, that our love for God's word is expressed in how we commit ourselves to obeying God's word. Love's not just a feeling, it's a function, it's an action. Love is expressed in what we do, not in what we feel. Because our feelings may change. We may feel excited today, but then we may feel down in the dumps tomorrow. And our emotions are always fleeting, but the Bible reminds us that if we're going to love God, we show that love for God by how we obey his word. That's what Jesus says in John 14 and 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. James 1 and 22 reminds us, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Jesus himself said, that our love for him is evidence in our obedience to his word. Our love for him is not best expressed in how we handle Sunday morning because we can do all the shouting on Sunday morning, 
and still raise all kind of cane Monday through Saturday. It's not expressing how we handle the Sunday morning experience because you know how to dress for Sunday morning. You know how to speak for Sunday morning. You know how to sing and pray for Sunday morning. But if you're not obeying the word of God, you're only giving God lip service. You're not serving him in love. Our commitment to loving God is expressed in how we obey his word. And that's why I want us to glean this simple yet serious theme from this lesson tonight. Love God by obeying his word. Love God by obeying his word. Your love for God is seen in your commitment to his word. So if you are committed to obeying God's word, that's how God knows you really do love his word. Not just in how you memorize it, not just in how you recite it, not in how you read it, but in how you obey it. That's how we show our love and commitment to the word of God when we obey the word of God. In these particular verses, share four reasons why we should commit ourselves to obeying God's word. First, we commit ourselves because we have experienced God's grace. We experience God's grace. Let's look again at verses 41 and 42. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Note the psalmist is demanding to God, let your steadfast love come to me, your salvation come to me according to your promise. He's literally asking God to give him grace. And he understands he has grace based off of his knowledge of God's word. And he's also asking for grace because in verse 42, he points out that he hasn't, he needs an answer for the enemy that taunts him. He gives us a picture of grace and reminds us that you do not have to be saved to experience grace. That grace comes in two particular forms. We have common grace and we have saving grace. All of us saved and unsaved experience common grace. If you woke up this morning, you experience God's grace. If you woke up with food on your table, you experienced God's grace. If you have physical health and strength, you experienced God's grace. If you have mental stability, you were kept in your right mind, you experienced God's grace. And that falls on both the saved and the unsaved, the just and the unjust. You do not have to be saved to experience God's grace. You may not be knowledgeable of it, but all of us, by the mere common grace of God, experience his grace on daily basis. If you avoided a car wreck on 220, that's experiencing God's grace. It's those common grace experiences that all of us have. But there's also the second dimension of grace where it's saving grace, where you've been redeemed from sin or you're freed from the bondage of sin, where you experience the blessings of salvation in Christ because of God's grace. That's saving grace. We all experience both common, we all experience common grace, but those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ experience saving grace. And we know that based off of our knowledge of the word of God. God's word teaches us about grace that we live in it but it shows us how we live in that grace. Ephesians chapter two points that out well, that we were dead in sin. We were consumed by sin. We were condemned because of sin. But Paul reminds the Ephesians, but God who was rich in mercy through the great love of which he loved us before we ever knew we needed grace, sent Jesus Christ to the cross and reminds us by grace, we have been saved so we can commit to God's word and love God's word by obeying it because it shows us our experience of grace and if you just look back at your own life's journey you'll be able to testify that I did not fully understand the grace of God until I began to study and read God's word I was living in it I felt it 
but I could not explain it until I picked up the Word of God and found out how the Word of God described my experience. God's Word gives us insight to our experience of grace. And that's why we can commit to it because it helps us understand what we experience when we experience the grace of God. And not only does it give us that information, it also gives us a response to those who taunt us. If you look in verse 42, the psalmist mentions that he wants and needs an answer for him who taunts me. It implies that this enemy that he was facing knew about his past, that he had one up on him. So he wanted God to give him his steadfast love. He needed salvation from God according to his promise so he would have an answer in response to those who taunted him. And this reminds us that the word of God gives us grace that allows us to respond to our enemies, reminding them that even though you know my past, God has given me grace that I'm not bound to the mistakes of my past when I am a recipient of God's saving grace. Romans chapter eight and one reminds us that there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. First John chapter two verses one through three tells us, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. When we commit ourselves to the word of God, it gives us grace to know that God does not hold us to the sins of our past. And we do not have to respond to our enemies who taunt us with the sins of our past. That we can respond to them saying that, listen, I'm walking in the grace of God. Yes, I made those mistakes, but Christ paid for them at Calvary. And I'm free from the bondage of your taunting. I'm free from the bondage of your condemnation because I walk in Christ Jesus. And Christ says, I'm not condemned by the sins of my past because he paid for it at Calvary. And we can only be committed to that response when we're committed to God's word. So when you obey the word of God, it helps you better understand and your, better explain your experience with grace because you know you've experienced God's grace. And that's why we should love and commit ourselves to obeying God's word, because it reminds us that we have experienced grace. So I, I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the one who died for me. How marvelous was that grace that caught my falling soul, because by his grace, he looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. So one reason why we should commit ourselves to obeying God's word is because we've experienced grace. But these verses also show us we should commit ourselves to obeying God's word because we experience hope. That's what we see in verse 43. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. The psalmist here is letting us know that the word of God yields hope. He's telling God, God, don't take your word from my mouth because my hope is in your word. The reason why we have hope in the temporal and the eternal is because of the word of God. The word of God informs us of our reality here on earth, but it also informs us of the reality to come in heaven. And as we view the reality of what's to come, knowing that there is glory on the other side, it gives us hope to know that this life is not the end, that troubles won't last always. That's why we should commit to the word of God, because it never fails to produce hope in our lives. That's why it's important for us to commit to it, to obey it and to study the word of God because it breeds hope in every situation we face. If you want hope for this pandemic, commit yourself to the word of God. If you want hope in this political climate where we are right now, 
Commit yourself to the word of God. If you want hope in your own personal life, commit yourself to the word of God. And as you commit to obeying the word of God, you will gain hope to know that troubles won't last always. We will get through this pandemic. Why? The word of God tells us so. We will be all right in this political climate. Why? The word of God tells us so. You will be okay in whatever personal situation you face. Why? Because the word of God tells us so. And this is not the end. There is glory on the other side in the midst of your own personal suffering. Why? The word of God tells us so. That's why we need to commit to the word of God, because the word of God reminds us we have hope in his word. So we commit to the word of God because we've experienced grace. We commit to the word of God because we experience hope. We also commit to the word of God because we experience freedom. Look at verses 44 and 45. I will keep your law continually forever and ever. And I shall walk in a wide place for I have sought your precepts. The English Standard Version uses the word wide place. But the New International Version explains it better that I will walk about in freedom. And the psalmist is saying here that our commitment to God's word is key because it allows us to walk in freedom. Here we see a contrast between the bondage of sin and the freedom of salvation. Sin binds you. Sin is addictive. Sin has its great pleasure, but sin has its great cost. Sin will have you shackled to think that there's only one way to live. That if you continue in sin, you will be bound to think that's the only way to live. That you have to take that bottle. That you have to take those drugs. That you have to live in this lifestyle. That you have to continually stay on this path. But the word of God shows you there's a better way to live, that salvation in Christ frees you to live the way that God designed you to live. And you can live in that freedom forever, as the psalmist says, because God's word gives you freedom to walk in wide places. It gives you freedom to walk in a free way. Salvation in Christ frees us from the penalty of sin. It frees us from the path of sin. It even frees us from the power of sin and ultimately will free us from the presence of sin. That's why we need to walk in God's word, because it reminds us there's a better way to live than to live in sin. That you don't have to be bound and shackled by your sins, that you don't have to commit yourself to living an addictive life of sin, that God's word reminds you salvation in Christ frees you from the path of sin. That's what Paul tells the New Testament church, that you've been freed from the bondage of sin. So don't be entangled again in that yoke. Christ has freed you. And as you commit yourself to the word of God, you know that you're walking in freedom, that you're no longer bound by sin, but you're now free to walk in the life that God has designed for you. That's why we need to commit ourselves to the word of God and obey it, because it reminds us I'm no longer bound in sin. I'm free. I don't have to be a slave to sin. I don't have to be a slave to alcoholism. I don't have to be a slave to fornication. I don't have to be a slave to homosexuality. I don't have to be a slave to lying. I don't have to be a slave to cheating. I'm free. And the word of God reminds me that I'm free because of what Christ did at Calvary. So we commit ourselves to the word of God because we've experienced grace. We've experienced hope. We experience freedom. These verses also show us we commit ourselves to the word of God because we experience boldness. That's what verse 46 and 47 tells us. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. For I find my delights in your commandments, which I love. Psalmist here says that he gains confidence by sharing God's word in the face of opposing threats. And note, he uses the word kings, which refers to political leaders who threaten to alter the way God's people would live according to his word. 
that once you have the word of God in you and you obey God's word, it gives you a confidence to call out what God has said to call out. We see this happen with Nathan and David as the prophet Nathan called David out for his indiscretions with Bathsheba. We see this with the three Hebrew boys and King Nebuchadnezzar as they would not bow down to the graven image that he made. We see it with John the Baptist as he called out Herod and his indiscretions. We see it with many of the Old Testament prophets who also called out kings and leaders for their indiscretions. That if you abide in the word of God and obey God's word, it gives you confidence to stand against kings and say that is wrong. That is not what the word of God says. God's word will give you confidence to trust his word and declare his word even when it's not the politically correct thing to do. And in the political climate where we are, we see now that many are tying their Christianity to a flag and not to Christ, to where they're praying for reelection, they're praying for new leadership, but not following the word of God. And in this political climate, we have to ask ourselves, what and who are we committed to? Are we committed to God's word or are we committed to the politics of the day? Are we committed to God's word? Are we committed to our ideas of what America should be? These verses really reject this idea of patriotic Christianity where Christianity is tied to a flag and not to Christ, where the symbol is the stars and stripes, not the cross, where you hear these leaders praying for re-election, praying for God to intervene in these politics when they simply need to do what the word of God says. Pray for your leaders, whoever your leader may be. Say no to laws that infringe on disobeying God's word. And you can only do that when you commit yourself to the word of God and not to political correctness. When we commit ourselves to God's word, it does not matter who's in the White House. We have confidence knowing God's word is stronger than any politician's speech. That's what it means to commit to God's word and be confident in it. You can stand in front of kings and declare, thus says the Lord, because you know God's word is stronger than any politician's word. That's why we can call out injustices when we see these racist acts happen in the White House and beyond. That's why we're able to still pray for our leaders even when we don't agree with their political agenda. It's why we can say no to laws that infringe on disobeying God's word because we know God's word is stronger and more powerful than any political agenda. That's why we need to commit ourselves to the word of God. We really need to cling to the words of the song we learned in Sunday school, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, not on the Declaration of Independence, not on the Emancipation Proclamation, not on the Constitution. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. That's why we should commit ourselves to God's word, because we experience boldness to stand before those, even when it's not politically correct. So we commit ourselves to the word of God because we've experienced grace. We experience hope. We experience freedom. We experience boldness. Finally, we commit ourselves to the word of God because we experience worship. That's what happens in verse 48. I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love and I will meditate on your statutes. Note, the psalmist is lifting his hands toward the word of God because he loves the word of God. He's saying that he vows to reach out for God's commandments because he holds those commandments in high regard. It really is the premise of this whole part of the passage where he's showing, I love God's word so much that I'm going to commit myself to it that I hold God's word in high regard to the point that I'm going to obey it because my commitment is expressed in how I obey God's word. And he says he'll meditate on his statutes. The word meditate, as we've learned, means to nag. It means to continually keep to mind. 
The first time we see this word mentioned in the Old Testament, it refers to walking in a particular way. It lets us know that meditation is not just something mental, but meditation on the word of God is physical, that you live in the word because you're committed to the word of God. That it's not just something you recite. It's not just something you call to mind. It's something you walk out every day of your life that as you meditate on it mentally, you live it out physically because you're committed to the word of God. And this is what it means to love God's word and be committed to God's word, that we love it so much that we show our commitment by obeying it. And since we love the word of God, we commit to the word of God and obeying it. And we're committed to the word of God and obeying the word of God because we love it. So as you reflect on this lesson, the question really is, how much do you love God's word? And if you love it as much as you say, do you show that love in your commitment to obeying God's word? As Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our love for God and his word is not expressed in how we feel. It's not necessarily expressed in what we say. It's expressed in our commitment to obey his word. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for reminding us of our love and commitment to your word. That love is not just expressed in our emotions. It's not just expressed in our words, but it's expressed in our obedience to follow and obey your word. Pray, God, that you will convict us where we may have fallen short in our commitment. Where we may have obeyed particular words, but not obeyed the whole word of God. That we may have loved you in our feelings we may have loved you in our words but we're not loving you by obeying your word convict us of where we have fallen short but more importantly give us grace to get it right with you that as we continue to love on you God we do so by obeying your word thank you for your word because your word never fails in Jesus name we pray amen a few announcements tonight as we're closing. Uh, if you've been blessed by tonight's lesson, if you're blessed by the ministry of St. Rest and you want to contribute to us, we encourage you to give. Uh, you have many different ways you can give to the life of our ministry here. You can give physically through our drop box that is available on campus. You can also give digitally through Givelify, Cash App, PayPal, and Google Pay. Many different methods, but the same mentality. God loves a cheerful giver. And I'm a witness. You can't beat God giving no matter how hard you try. So if you were blessed tonight by tonight's lesson and you've been blessed by the ministry here at St. Rest and want to give, you have those methods to give. We would encourage and appreciate your contributions as they come. And of course, we're still celebrating our 135th church anniversary. This past Sunday, we came back in the sanctuary for our reentry service. What a beautiful time of fellowship that we had with our members and with one another. And we're still carrying on that celebration now. Uh, as we've mentioned in previous lessons, we have an assessment all month, $135. One dollar for each year St. Rest has been in existence. If you want to commit to that, Again, you can give through the methods we've mentioned before, and we will take those contributions all month long. You don't have to designate it for one particular Sunday or Wednesday. You can map it out however you feel comfortable and provide those contributions all month long. We're going to keep celebrating as God continues to bless us here at St. Rest. But tonight, we also want to mention our veterans. Happy Veterans Day to those who have served our country and those members at St. Rest who have served our country faithfully. We thank God for your life and your service. We pray God's continued blessings on you and our nation as a whole in the days to come. And of course, we wanna close with several prayer requests and prayer needs we have. We wanna to continue to keep our family in prayer and our church family in prayer as a whole as they deal with illnesses and bereavement. We wanna pray for Sister Elaine Turner, who's still dealing with doctor's visits and has a couple of other procedures that are coming so we definitely want to keep her lifted in prayer. We want to pray for the Slater family as Deacon Slater continues 
this journey that he's been on. We thank God for the grace that he's given him through this bout of sickness, and we're still praying for his healing in days to come. We want to keep the Piper family lifted in prayer after the transition of Deacon Robert Piper Sr. Pray that you will continue to keep that family lifted in prayer as they deal with grief in this hour of bereavement. We also want to pray for the Rogers family as Deacon Rogers is still dealing with the transition of his sister. And also pray for the Lanier family after Deacon Lanier lost his cousin. Uh, pray for that family as well as they're dealing with bereavement and transition. And you may know of others and you may have prayer requests and prayer needs that you want us to pray for and pray with. I would ask that you would comment below. Let us know what prayer needs and prayer requests you have. We believe in the power of prayer and want to walk with you, covering you and believe in prayer, knowing God is able to hear and answer our prayers. Let's pray as we close. God, again, we thank you for this privilege of prayer. We can call out to you. You'll hear us and answer us. I pray now that you would intervene in those requests that we've mentioned. We pray, God, for Sister Elaine Turner as she continues to uh, deal with these medical procedures and medical visits. God, intervene as you have done in times past. We thank you for the progress that's been made thus far. We thank you for the healing that's taking place in days to come. We continue to pray for Deacon Slater. Thank you for the grace you've shown him. Continue to heal him according to your will. We pray for his family and give them strength. We pray for the Piper family, God, as they continue to deal with the memories of Deacon Robert Piper Sr. Thank you for his life and legacy. God, bring them peace in these moments that as they experience grief, give them your grace that is sufficient for everything they need. We pray the same for the Rogers family. Pray the same for the Lanier family as both have dealt with a loss of a loved one. Give them peace that surpasses all understanding. God, tonight we pray for those who are watching whatever prayer requests and prayer needs they have, both spoken and unspoken. God, you know better than we can see. So we pray you intervene in those spaces where they need your divine hand. And God, whenever you do, whatever you do on our behalf, give us a mind to say thank you. Help us have a heart of gratitude as you meet our needs according to your will. Thank you for your word again tonight. Thank you for what you're doing here at St. Rest and beyond. We love you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.